Um, welcome to the second webinar that we're hosting this year as part of the Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation to unpack the different elements or buckets of the framework. Um, just last week, we had um, a webinar on uh, internet governance and coordination fragmentation. Um, and for those of you who came to that, um, I'm, I hope you'll agree that that was a very um, interesting and invigorating discussion. Um, and we had quite a lot of um, uh, things to, to consider how we could further refine and unpack. And we'll be getting back to you about how we do that within this policy network. Um, some concrete, uh, certainly some concrete uh, discussions about what can be done as well. So um, now we're turning our, our attention to uh, internet fragmentation as it pertains to user experience. And um, I just wanted to share with you uh, the, the plan for today, um, we, as uh, we did last week and as we will do for the third um, webinar in, in this series, um, we are looking at uh, specific questions to guide the discussion around um, user experience uh, fragmentation of, from the perspective of user experience. And um, those are displayed um, for, for you to see um, on the screen. Um, so it's it's really asking what um, what is use the uh, fragmentation of user experience, what is it not? Um, what poses the highest risks or prioritizing um, within that? And then what can we do about that? And so what we're going to do, and we're very lucky to, to have um, some speakers today, some some great speakers who've agreed to share their thoughts, drawing on their expertise and their, their research or, or their work really um, uh, to, to answer these questions. Um, so we will go to them. And what we've asked is that they respond to the first couple of questions. And we really encourage you to do the same on the chat. Um, react, uh, offer your own um, answers, and then we will uh, facilitate a, a broader discussion um, with, uh, with everyone after those two questions, and then we'll turn to the third question. We do have 90 minutes, um, and so we're hoping that we can have a really robust discussion here, uh, and then we'll wrap up with um, some takeaways and next steps. So without Further ado, let me start with some, some intros. Uh, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> my name is Shisal Kumar and I'm Head of Global Engagement and Advocacy at Global Partners Digital, but um, also one of the co-facilitators of this policy network along with Bruna, um, who's here. Bruna, did you wanna say hi? Yes, a hello and welcome everyone to the call. It's really been, been really happy to see um, yet another discussion happening and hopeful. I'm hopeful about the discussions today. So nice to see everyone. Thanks so much. Um, and Wim, I'm actually going to turn to you and you can introduce um, yourself um, because we're going to do the, I think, um, the brief overview before we then go to the speakers who I'll um, briefly introduce then. So shall we, shall we go straight to the overview, if that's OK? Thank you. That's okay for me. And uh, hi, all. Uh, I'm uh, Wim de Rizella. I'm a, uh, working as a consultant and support. I'm supporting the work of the Policy Network uh, on Internet Fragmentation on behalf of the IGF Secretariat. Uh, I did it this year and uh, also last year. Um, so let me give a brief introdu introduction to the work of the um, Policy Network, uh, or what a Policy Network uh, actually is. It is one of the intersessional activities of the IGF. Uh, that means a, intersessional activities were created so that um, the community can work or can discuss some uh, topics, some policy topics in between an IGF meeting and also work on some more uh, concrete or substantive output. Uh, as often before there was um, there was the, the criticism that uh, there were very interesting uh, discussions at the IGF meeting, 
but not much, um, or it was just a one point in time and not much was done before and after. Uh, so that's uh, why the uh, policy networks and also best practice forums were created. Uh, now the policy network on internet fragmentation uh, was created to uh, further the discussion on and uh, on fragmentation and to raise awareness of the technical, policy, uh, legal, and regulatory measures and actions that pose a risk to the open, interconnected, and interoperable internet. As already mentioned, um, the PMS BNNF uh, started last year. Uh, that's <clears throat> why it um, started last year. And the initial uh, proposal that was submitted uh, envisioned a two-year time frame, uh, where in um, the first year, basically, uh, the idea or the plan was to offer a systematic and comprehensive framework to define internet fragmentation, its intended and unintended, unintended causes, and its potential effects. Uh, I will come back to that on the uh, next slide, as it was mainly what we uh, focused on last year. And then, uh, based on that, using that framework uh, to collect and analyze case studies, and to fine tune and complement the framework. Uh, one of the things we are doing today, and based on all those discussions, establish, try to establish, or at least work towards shared principles, recommendations, or uh, codes of conduct that can help to prevent fragmentation, and again, to preserve the open, interconnected, and uh, interoperable internet. So last year, um, we uh, tried to come up with the, well, we first tried to come up with a definition on what internet fragmentation is, but we very quickly learned from the discussions uh, that it is almost an impossible task because there are so many or too many visions and views, and you very easily end up in having 90 minute discussions on uh, just black and white, yes or no, people just, uh, well, competing for their ideas on what uh, fragmentation is, uh, what fragmentation is not, and what definitely should not be uh, discussed under the uh, under the title of fragmentation. So we came up with, um, uh, based on that, uh, we came up with a framework uh, where we, instead of trying to define, trying to create a space uh, where we can, uh, or where different uh, stakeholders come together to discuss fragmentation, uh, what we did is we created uh, three baskets uh, and under those baskets, uh, it is possible to have a discussion without having uh, that yes or no what fragmentation is. So we, uh, based on the discussions we had the last year, uh, we um, created three baskets. The first one, fragmentation of the user experience, uh, which we will further um, develop today and, and uh, hope to hear your uh, views uh, on that. Fragmentation of the uh, internet's technical layer, uh, for some people um, in, in the debate, the, probably the most important or the only uh, element that should be called fragmentation. Uh, and we also um, knew, basically knew through our webinars last year, um, realized that there is also a fragmentation of internet governance and coordination. Uh, that was discussed, that was a topic um, of our discussion last year. So that is the basic framework we created with, as you can see, the um, three baskets are not islands. I mean, they they are interlinked to each other and they in influence each other. And they're all that all three of them are also under the um, the influence of uh, uh, continuously evolving technical, political, commercial uh, developments uh, that might have intended or unintended uh, consequences. So this is the framework, this is the basis, um, and this is why we are, uh, we are here discussing one of the baskets, uh, fragmentation of the user experience. And we um, hope to learn from that, get a clear idea on what um, the different views are, uh, to then maybe later on see what is possible, what are the links with the other baskets uh, when we had the three calls uh, or the three webinars, and then hopefully by uh, IGF uh, this year in, uh, in October, be able to make uh, a next step. So I will leave it there.
the introduction. I would say if you want to um, more detail, please check the uh, the output report we had last year. We created last year. It is available on the uh, uh, PNF web web page, uh, and the link is on the last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Wim. That was, uh, I think, very helpful background for those of you who might be less familiar with the journey to where we are now um, on this, this policy network and, and the framework. Um, and now we wanted to turn to our speakers, um, and I'm going to ask uh, Marielsa first um, from UNESCO. Uh, and Marielsa, please feel free to say a bit more about yourself um, if you would like. Um, when you you come in, um, and as we mentioned, if you could explain a bit about how you see um, fragmentation of the user experience, what it is and what it isn't, and what what examples you could provide that pose the highest risk in your in your perspective, um, that would be that would be great. So just a few minutes offering some perspectives on that, please, and then we'll turn to the other speakers, and then we'll open up. As I said, please feel free to engage in the chat. In the meantime, everyone, Mary, also over to you. Uh, thank you, Chitao. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, um, Maria, I'm Maria Oliveira. I'm the director um, of uh, digital inclusion policies and transformation, um, and uh, actually the secretary of the Information for All program here in the communication sec uh, and information sector of UNESCO um, at headquarters. Um, so um, I'm responsible for, you know, all these issues of uh, digital inclusion, by, you know, uh, digital uh, 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 engagement and all the work that we do uh, to support digital transformation here. Um, th those questions that you ask uh, are, are right at the heart of what UNESCO does, because UNESCO's mandate is literally to promote and protect the free flow of ideas by word and image. And when we say that, when uh, um, we're looking at, uh, for example, the internet, you know, we, we all know that it's a global network of interoperable networks and services. In terms of, of infrastructure, it's actually already fragmented. But for users, it is or is expected to be uh, experienced as a, as a seamless, open, global, online, public sphere uh, where people can exchange uh, ideas, you know, in, in the different ways, freely exchange ideas, services, data, digital goods, and whatever. But more and more, we see that internet users are being prevented from accessing content they wish to access or engaging with others they wish to associate with the, the different types of uh, blocks put in place, you know, by, by different actors, uh, commercial governments, and so on and so forth. And this is different from access to a specific websites and networks because it actually happens even when the internet is technically said to be open. When connectivity is maintained you know, at, the, at the technical level, but the users are still restricted or limited in their practical access to the content that they desire to see or to engaging with their friends live online through games or you know, WhatsApp or, or, or whatever. And these blocks have become, you know, uh, they actually become violations of specific fundamental freedoms and human rights that are spelled out in international covenants, you know. So just to pass through some of those very quickly, you know, the international covenant, uh, uh, covenant of uh, civil and political rights, you know, Article 19, it's about freedom of expression, but also about, you know, uh, um, it, in, it embeds the right to access information. So the article actually says that everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. And this right includes freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers in any, in, and through any medium uh, uh, that they choose. So, you know, each of those elements is actually uh, you know, impacted by fragmentation, the right to seek, to right to receive, and the right to impart, you know, information and ideas. And this is, you know, a, a really big deal. Um, then you have the right, uh, Article 21, uh, which is uh, the right to us of assembly. And when you think of, uh, of the internet, for example, a cyberspace, you know, which is uh, this virtual space, the right of peaceful assembly shall be recognized and no restrictions shall be placed 
on the exercise of this right, other than those, you know, in conformity with laws and etc. And so that Article 21 is also also impacted by internet uh, uh, fragmentation. And then a third one is Article 22 on freedom of association, because more and more we're actually interacting online live like we're doing right now. So the everyone shall have the right to freedom of association with others. Um, and no restriction shall be placed on the exercise of this right, you know, other than those prescribed by law and necessary in a democratic society. So this is, you know, this is a big deal, you know, uh, because we're talking about, you know, essentially fragmentation being impacting, you know, fundamental freedoms and human rights. And, um, you know, and, and the expansion of, uh, of fragmentation is, uh, is actually something also that impacts other rights due to the ways in it, 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 which uh, it's done. You know, for example, you know, it's, uh, it's, it certainly is consolidating concentration of power, knowledge, wealth in the, you know, in the hands of a very few large actors. And this is done, you know, uh, essentially premised uh, on the expansion of uh, profiling techniques that has uh, that, that lead to mass customization and other forms of fragmentation of the internet that actually reach individual or even cohort levels, you know, of, of groups of people. But you can actually you know, almost fragment, customize down to one individual uh, 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 user. So this is really only possible given the sophistication of these profiling techniques that ad tech companies have developed. And that actually are premised on yet another human rights violation, which is the right to privacy. The article 17, uh, uh, that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interfer interference with this privacy, family, home or correspondence, uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and the issues of freedom of thought you know, uh, as well, because, you know, the, these people, you know, not only are segmented and targeted with ads, but actually, you know, nudged towards the specific uh, uh, thoughts and behaviors, you know, so that us also affects Article 18 on the right to freedom of thought, you know, so um, this is, this is a, an issue that is also um, affected by the growing process of uh, platformization of the internet, and of zero rating practices, uh, uh, which are both uh, ways of discouraging users to go beyond internet access uh, at no direct financial cost, you know, and to stay within platforms such as Facebook and others that offer, you know, specific users uh, free access, let's put it this way, through their own uh, 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 mechanisms. And, um, you know, and this is important because there are, you know, essentially two issues, you know, first, we know that the number of internet users is grew fast, you know, uh, since the start of the of the COVID nineteen pandemic. The ITU, for example, says that uh, about seven hundred fifty million people joined the internet between two thousand and twenty first and two thousand and twenty second, and these people did not join before because they saw no value on the internet, but because they really could not afford the combination of connectivity devices and data packages that is needed for access. So they are the most prone, the uh, ones to grab on zero rating uh, practices and stay within specific platforms. And already there are some studies showing uh, the impacts on how these users consume ideas because they stay within platforms. For example, in Brazil, uh, Brazil's uh, Consumer Protection Agency uh, had, uh, has found out that uh, these users, they only consume news media headlines which are tend to be clickbaity and frequently very misleading, which gives them, you know, actual misinformation. They don't read the articles. They don't actually read the news. They read only the, uh, you know, clickbait that attracted them to the articles and then form a very big misconception of what the content of that, uh, of that news article is. And the second big deal about that is platformization actually subsumes public services also under a commercial platform. So you end up violating yet another human right, Article 25, which is the right to take part in public affairs, that every citizen shall have the right and the opportunity without distinction uh, and restrictions to take part in the conduct of public affairs. So the right to public education, the right to, you know, uh, uh, and to uh, access to justice, the right to access to you know a, a series of public services like that should not be restricted. 
and they should have equality of access you know, to public services you know, um, without any type of restriction. The other type of, uh, of a system that really impacts uh, uh, rights as well is recommended systems, the particularly those of streaming services for films, music, et cetera, that also affect our right to enjoy culture. Well, Article 15 of the International Covenant on Social, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that says that uh, we, are, uh, um, we have the right to take part in cultural life and to enjoy, enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and that we should have the choice, you know, as to what, you know, uh, uh, we, are, we are trying to consume it, uh, and access in terms of, uh, of culture, in terms of, uh, of uh, education and so on. So fragmentation from the user experience perspective is really limiting, it is about limiting access to content and to social interaction, limiting the free flow of ideas and, it, it, and it's insidious, it's invisible. Many times it's even actually desired. For example, you know, if, you, if your user uh, prefers zero rating uh, uh, because they cannot afford you know, to have the full service and could be dangerous when we are thrown into echo chambers that drive social polarization. And so, you know, just to me, the cost and the biggest uh, harms and the biggest uh, uh, problem with this is the impact to social cohesion to our capacity to coexist in the same reality and find common ground. And this is a really big deal when, when we live in a world in which our biggest challenges are global challenges. We're talking about climate change, growing inequalities, you know, uh, uh, big geopolitical conflicts. And if we cannot exist in the same reality, understand, you know, be exposed to different points of view, how can we form opinions and negotiate with uh, our ways around those if we don't even have a shared understanding of what the problems are. So uh, I'll stop here and leave uh, uh, you know, the, the conversation to others, but uh, thank you for giving me the chance to, to show you know, some of our ideas, thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. And um, I think you brought a lot there, um, particularly uh, um, as you started, you said that there could be um, and in many situations, there is the technically um, an open internet or the ability to um, connect um, in theory, but actually in practice, uh, there is prevention in, in accessing content um, or a certain manipulation um, of what um, users will see um, and that this has variety of impacts and is also directly related to the undermining or violations of, of human rights. Um, so I think that, that that's all very much something we can take into consideration as well when we hear from the other speakers, but also interested to hear um, from, from you um, as well, those, those of you who have joined us today um, about whether some of these examples, whether it's uh, zero rating, platformization, um, or, or restrictive, you know, uh, restricting information flows also uh, resonates with you as examples of um, user fragmentation users experience fragmentation. So thank you so much for that. Very rich, lots to think about there. Um, and I was, wanted to now come to you, Farzana, if that's okay. Um, you're joining us, I think, uh, with um, Digital Medusa hat on perhaps, or if that's not true, please correct me. Uh, but we'd love to hear from you now, um, drawing on your, your experience in research. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Farzana Badi, and I'm the founder of Digital Medusa. And the mission of Digital Medusa is to protect the core values of the internet, uh, interconnectedness, interoperability, and its global nature. Um, so the issue of fragmentation is very much um, uh, aligned with the mission of uh, Digital Medusa. So, uh, but this, these are all my uh, personal thesis and opinion that I have uh, gathered uh, throughout research and talking to various stakeholders um, uh, and uh, would appreciate any kind of feedback. And of course, I, there is a lot of disagreements on uh, of, like the word fragmentation and fragmentation of, uh, of the internet, which I prefer not to really uh, focus on that uh, disagreement, uh, but uh, I'm going to discuss uh, uh, how like user experiences uh, can, um, uh, how like the tools that we use and how the different use user experiences uh, can be um, 
uh, can be uh, actually affect access to the global internet. So, what is a what is the user experience when we are talking about user experiences uh, on the internet? What are we talking about? So, the internet is now beyond um, a means for communication. It's to access uh, essential services online and uh, also uh, like as well as uh, media and content. Uh, so uh, we uh, have access to financial uh, services online. We have access to uh, public services online and uh, all, uh, all these experiences. But um, uh, there is one experience that is about access, whether you have access to a certain service or content online. And... Um, there is another which is about interaction uh, with uh, with the with the content um, that uh, like the user whether the whether the service uh, provider the, the platform uh, provider restricts access of uh, people or certain people um, uh, from uh, uh, from the platform or certain content on the platform. So this kind of like the interaction uh, with uh, with the with the networks and the platforms uh, and the different experiences they have existed for a very long time. We have had this, and I don't think that's fragmentation. But let's not even go there. Uh, I, I promise that I'm not going to say, say anything. But um, but that is not so. But then uh, because of like for example. Um, some some users might have access to um, uh, to internet as a low uh, latency, so they like their access to content like they can like access it like faster or slower. And uh, there are also um, the geo uh, blocking, so uh, ge uh, geographically there are certain con uh, contents online that uh, uh, certain countries don't want um, their and users to have access to, and this goes beyond like democratic or undemocratic. France does it, Iran does it, um, uh, but also, of course, obviously to um, extreme extent uh, in, in each. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, so one of the, I think that uh, when we come to uh, kind of prioritizing and what we should really uh, address. Um, is to uh, what what actually manifests the uh, the highest risk to access to the internet. Uh, we need to uh, kind of look at what sort of services uh, when uh, when they are what sort of digital services when they are blocked online, uh, they impact severely the online presence of users and their access to the global internet. So I give you an example. Um, if I don't have access to Zoom um, uh, because uh, my country blocks it or Zoom does not want to provide uh, its video conferencing uh, service um, to uh, certain countries because they are sanctioned. Um, so what sort of is my access to the, in the global internet hampered? No. But what is hampered here is my access to the services. Are there alternatives to this service? Yes, in theory. But also I can uh, generally use alternative, like I can use a VPN, to kind of access uh, access Zoom uh, and uh, if they're available and if it's legal in, in my country. So there are alternatives. So my framing in prioritizing what uh, sort of access and what sort of user experience is uh, really important uh, is whether there is an alternative to that service or to that platform that can give me access to that kind of content and service and how that affects my access to the internet. If there is alternative, um, then uh, I think that it is important to study, but I don't think that it's of high priority. 
networks, different networks, Facebook wants to uh, regulate and uh, govern its platform in a certain way. Um, uh, other uh, other platforms uh, uh, want don't want to have certain content on uh, on uh, on their platform, so they do content moderation. And uh, so, but then there are alternatives. I I know. Uh, so there are alternatives to uh, that kind of like access to these kind of platforms and content. In general, now I'm not going through. I'm not going to go to how difficult it is and stuff like that. I just mean that whether we that that kind of like this this framework considers how it impacts access to the uh, access to the global internet. So if Facebook uh, does, uh, if if a government in another country comes up with a, with a law uh, that blocks access of its citizen to certain content, that does not affect me uh, and my online presence. But then there are certain digital services that when we don't have access to, uh, then our online presence might be hampered. And uh, those uh, digital uh, services, uh, like they are mostly digital, uh, they are mo mostly uh, uh, operators of the critical uh, properties of the internet. Uh, which means that, uh, like, for example, if you uh, don't have uh, access to uh, IP addresses, uh, you cannot go online. Or if you want to, if there are DNS, if, uh, if, if so many DNS uh, resolvers decide not to serve you and your domain name queries, then you, you cannot go to certain websites. Uh, and uh, so that those are the kinds of, um, and, but but then there are alternatives to that as well. But do, these are the kind I think that we need to prioritize access to digital services that affect um, our online presence and access to uh, to the uh, global internet. And then after that, uh, yes, Shital, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question in case other people, you know, were also thinking the same. So um, you mentioned um, that you you think it's important to differentiate between different types of um, uh, not, for example, being able to access what you're not able to access, and um, when we're talking about user um, fragmentation. And so I wanted to ask, would you say then that the wholesale blocking of, um, of a service or a platform um, service like, let's say, um, Twitter or Facebook does not count um, because it's the digital services you mean are access to IP, um, uh, for example, as opposed to the, the actual platform? I don't mean they, they do count, but I don't okay. think that's in the framework of fragmentation. I don't think that this is a problem that we should uh, we should discuss and address through other means. And uh, what we uh, what we need to prioritize, in my opinion, uh, is that, uh, for example, when when there's like so Twitter is not an uh, internet infrastructure. So the services it provides, like if you don't, if you are banned from Twitter, you can go somewhere else on the internet, right? The user experience. So uh, here, I I also like, don't think that differences in user experiences in their access to digital services that are that don't hamper their online presence. It's really um, not a fragmentation question. And uh, it also, I also disagree that, for example, zero rating uh, is, a, uh, is a fragmentation uh, question. And there is uh, a lot of disagreement on that. Okay. Um, but nice. uh, so, um, so uh, as long as, so, so my method is, as long as there is an alternative to uh, those services online, then, uh, and then, uh, then we need to we need to first sort out the problem of those services that we don't have any other alternative to, and they severely impact our connectivity and access to uh, the uh, to the internet. 
So first we need to prioritize that. So this means that we need to go around and tell the government not to uh, uh, not to block uh, cross-border da data flow with their um, uh, with their regulations. We need to also talk about sanctions and how that can hamper uh, access to uh, services. But uh, so, but then also like you have this concept called uh, geo uh, fencing that uh, based on the IP addresses of your location, certain financial services online, they don't provide their services to you. This can be due to various reasons. They can be like legal compliance and uh, stuff like that. Whether those are also like this, that's like fragmentation of user experience, but I don't think it's internet fragmentation. I also don't think that, you know, I think it is a big issue but I also don't think that it should be prioritized. So um, I think that there is a question. Let's let's have a conversation if that if that's okay. Uh, I think Yik Chan is a uh, because I think I have another five minutes. I prefer that they ask their questions. Okay. Um. Thanks. Uh. Well, Victoria also had a question or rather a comment. Um. There. Um. And I don't know whether you want to take the floor. Um. But I think what, one of the things I wanted to highlight um, that I, I hope that I understood, um, Farzana, is that you are saying there are some examples of user fragmentation um, that we could commonly refer to, like geofencing or blocking, but those are not priorities in your view and shouldn't be referred to as internet fragmentation, but they're yes. still fragmentation of the use for the user from their perspective. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So that is right. And I have an answer to Victoria, but I think Yik Chan uh, hand is up. So okay, uh, let's go to Yik Chan. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry, because I'm in Beijing. It's uh, 2 p.m. 2 a.m. So I I'm sorry I didn't switch on the camera because I'm on the bench. Okay. Uh, basically, I think um, I think that the, the, we, we had a discussion about the fragmentation before. I think uh, basically we need to clarify the concept. What, what do we mean by the fragmentation? And uh, because there's a, uh, also a concept called the diversity, you know, because we were celebrating the diversity of the internet, like the, uh, the, 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 the multi-language, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, as well. So that's why we said we should not have only one language, like uh, English, uh, we should have a multi-language. Uh, uh, so that's what ICON was doing to try to promote a uh, different language in the domain name as well. So, so, so that my question is, uh, how can, can we, so if we talk about the fragmentation of user experience, so we also need to think about the concept of the diversity because there's a different cultural backgrounds. And also I think uh, there's a different uh, legal jurisdictions as well in terms of uh, content regulation, you know, and uh, and uh, also how, how, how user can use this, uh, uh, even talk about uh, uh, concentration or manipulations, a different jurisdiction have a different legal regulation on that. So I just want, don't want to fragmentation become overtaking of the other concepts like a diversity. And because we had a, uh, also the, the um, I mean, Professor Milton Muller who proposed this term fragmentation, actually what he means is about, uh, there's a different layer. When he re referred to the fragmentation in the very early beginning, the fragmentation actually is referred to the layer, the, the certain layer, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the protocol layer, which means if you uh, uh, block people's access to the uh, to the IP uh, to the protocol layer, which means you fragment the infrastructure of the internet. That was the ori original meaning of fragmentation. So you uh, fragmented the whole infrastructure level. But now we seem to use fragmentation refer to like uh, everything, you know. So I, I think we really need to uh, narrow the concept down and make it clear. Otherwise, we can replace any experience like a blocking, uh, censorship, or all these things uh, with fragmentation. So I, I have a very serious uh, doubt about that using these terms. You know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. And um, that's actually one of the aims of of our work. Certainly, here is to 
be more nuanced and specific um, about these uh, these terms. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Frazana, would you mind um, re responding uh, to that? And then also perhaps if you want to also respond to uh, Victoria's point and then um, we will move to Zach. Thank yeah, you. I'm sorry. I don't know. I, I don't want to take Zach, uh, Zach's uh, time uh, too much of uh, Time, but I'm I'm just gonna be brief. Yes, exactly. So um, I I do I just think that it's not uh, um like we we have a problem here, and uh, the problem is the risk to uh, global uh, to access to the global internet, and uh, this is this is how I define things. And whether this is internet fragmentation or not, I don't necessarily um like want to focus on it. Uh, but I think that what this this group uh, this is like uh, 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 this group I think is is doing real really interesting work on kind of like putting us uh, like uh, making us focus on uh, what is uh, really uh, internet fragmentation. But I I don't think that should prevent us from like also discussing other dangers to uh, having uh, like access uh, to uh, the global uh, internet. So, uh, but I totally agree that user different user experiences might not in some uh, instances might not be internet friendly. Uh, but Vittorio, uh, I agree with you. Uh, this is why I think that we should have a um, kind of like a, uh, this method of, okay, is there an alternative? Is there is there a meaningful alternative to this platform for the users um, uh, that they can go and have access to? If yes, then great. Like for example, when we have like the consolidation of internet uh, providers, like the cl uh, the cloud pro uh, providers, then that might also like hamper our kind of like uh, uh, having the alternative to go around and and shop around. So, uh, so always have that in mind. I think that fragmentation has a spectrum. And uh, I use this alternative, uh, like having an alternative uh, test in order to have a better uh, uh, like understanding of how severe is the problem. Do we have a fragment, severe fragmentation problem here that we have to solve it now or not? Or are there other tools to actually solve the problem? Maybe this is not it. this we don't have to talk to uh, talk about it as internal fragmentation to sub solve the problem. And yeah, sorry, I talked too long. And, That's uh, great. No, thank you so much. I think um, that point about a, a, a spectrum um, of, of severity is something that's, that came up last year as we were developing framework um, and it's come up since as well. So it's definitely something for us to, to consider. Um, and and you mentioned, you know, the, the, whether or not there's a meaningful alternative and the focus being on being able to access the global internet. So those are all different elements of this discussion we can unpack further on. But Zach, I uh, wanted to hand it over to you uh, for your perspectives on what user fragmentation is and isn't um, and some examples you you would like to provide. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, and appreciate everyone speaking today and, you know, kind of providing all their perspectives. You know, this is super fascinating. Um, so from my end, so I'm, I'm Zach Ross and I'm, I'm the uh, data analyst uh, for the Keep It On campaign at Access Now. Um, so we're primarily looking at the idea of internet shutdowns, and I'm not familiar with the entire history of, you know, maybe why we use that term instead of fragmentation or what areas that overlaps with everyone. So um, I'll probably just provide kind of our perspective on what a shutdown is um, and maybe how that, um, you know, can be thinked of, thought of in term of, terms of fragmentation or where it can't be. Um, so we really define a shutdown in particular as an intentional disruption of the internet or electronic communications, rendering them inaccessible or effectively unusable for a specific population or within a location, often to exert control over the flow of information. So we're looking at kind of a broad, you know, group of different, you know, actions by um, governments, uh, by warring parties, and you know, uh, things like this of, you know, forced disconnection from the internet either through blanket internet shutdowns, um, shutdowns of, of fundamental social media apps that are largely all that many people use, uh, targeted disruptions through mobile internet shutdowns, uh, throttling and, and 
really everything in between. And you know, we've seen uh, through our most recent annual report over 187 um, individual internet shutdown orders globally. And these range from shutdowns happening during protest movements, um, now in the act of uh, you know war and act of conflicts. Uh, commonly, you know, shutdowns are used and weaponized during school exams and during elections. So um, it, it's kind of interesting to, to hear these finer points about censorship and um, you know, zero rating and all these different things. But you know, functionally, when you were talking about fragmentation from the internet, uh, you know, looking at it from a shutdown perspective, they're happening broadly, and people are disconnected, you know, broadly in, in, in all these different um, contexts. Um, and a few of the trends that we're seeing um, are that uh, they're happening alongside uh, pretty grave human rights abuses uh, and violence. So out of those 187 shutdowns, um, and I'm happy to provide this report, and so don't worry about numbers. I'm happy to provide the, the kind of data and information um, that uh, 48 of these uh, shutdowns coincided with documented human rights abuses. So these are grave human rights abuses involving violence, murder, uh, apparent war crimes, you know, just the most serious violations of human rights. Um, obviously, I, in our view, any internet shutdown is a violation of, of human rights. And, you know, Marielza was talking about, you know, freedom of expression and all these different things. And that's definitely all true, you know, but also thinking about what it means to be disconnected from the internet um, in times of, of crisis and conflict, um, you know, I think is crucial for this conversation. Um, also thinking about in terms of, you know, these, these places where shutdowns have been in place for functionally months to years um, in Tigray, uh, Ethiopia, and Myanmar, where there's just completely, you know, no internet for, you know, for years now, um, and, and kind of what that means. Obviously, they're, they're fragmented off the global internet. And, and then kind of the last piece I'll, I'll say, just to kind of keep the, keep the conversation moving, because I think there's a lot to, to kind of dive into here, um, would be shutdowns um, that are imposed um, to get people off of the global internet. So there's a few examples of this. Uh, one would be in Iran during the, the protest movements um, last year, um, where we saw shutdowns where uh, people were disconnected during protests or in kind of those contexts, um, but they could still access the national intranet, right? And, you know, what does that, what does that mean, you know, for, for fragmentation, I think is, you know, interesting to consider, as well as, you know, during Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, um, that they were rerouting uh, internet uh, through Crimea from Ukrainian internet and you know connected to the global internet to heavily surveilled censored Russian internet and kind of the implications for that. So just a few thoughts, but uh, yeah, happy to talk more. Thanks. Thank you so much. I mean, I see um, a lot here in the chat as well, which I've been trying to follow. Um, and uh, Frazana, you've shared an impact matrix um, and you, you mentioned impact or spectrum on, on, in terms of severity on um, how, how much it uh, impacts access. But what I'm hearing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, if you feel like this doesn't reflect your understanding of the discussion so far, which we've had both on the chat um, and orally, uh, is that there is this um, consideration of, of access and sort of being able to access um, um, the network and content. So there's a spectrum along that um, of, of what we mean um, when we talk about whether um, there is fragmentation happening, but disrupting the free flow of ideas and information, perhaps some comments here around intentionality and the severity of that and whether there's a meaningful alternative or all elements to to perhaps consider here and shutdowns I think what perhaps what you were saying Zach there is it's an example I'm not saying that it is um but perhaps it's one of a severe something severe um that 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 results in in the user fragmentation and, and you explained um that it is happening more frequently and that there are more different types of examples as well of, of that and how severe the those can be. Um, I think what's also helpful about the, the shutdown research that you, you do um, at Access Now and keep it on um, is, of course, the, the 
the the depth of information that we could we can we can look at um, in terms of identifying whether it's it's or agreeing on um, yeah uh, metrics or or criteria when when we look at the discussion in the context of of user experience. Um, Sorry, um, I just had to look at the chat again. So I've just lost my train of thought there. But I hope that that's a bit helpful in terms of bringing us here to the um, to the last question, uh, just kind of summarizing, you know, where we are and um, uh, what what everyone has said so far. Um, particularly, I thought what you put is that in the chat, which people have really um, responded to around the different concepts, you know, whether we're talking about blocking access or um, localization and linguistic diversity is different because we're not talking, um, when we talk about diversity or localization of content about not being able to access content, we're just talking about diversity there. So it's actually a, a, a different um, discussion because, um, of, of the the relevance or not um, of the question of whether you can access the network and content um, that you wish to, um, and uh, the the that that was a point I think made earlier as well by by Marielsa. So let's move on, if that's okay, to the next part um, of the discussion, which is about what we um, what we do. Um, recommendations about about this uh, these issues and and if you if you have any specific ones that would be great to hear um, so I'm going to to go around um, now in in the same order if that's okay so starting with Marielza and then we'll go to Frizana and then to Zach and of course keep keep back ah, please keep it going actually I have to turn to Bruna now. <laughs> You know, I think we were we were going to 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 swap here, right? Um, in terms of the last segment of our discussion. Yes, I mean, I'm not an issue. I was also following the such relevant discussions, and and it's always um a little bit appalling but interesting to see like how people approach the same matter from different perspectives. And in the end of the day, I think what we want to like kind of convey or translate in these conversations, it's how hard it is for the end user to fully grasp what fragmentation could actually mean or like how do you feel as part of like um, some of some process that's at least in the beat related to internet fragmentation and to translate it in general. So thanks all for, for the intervention so far. As um, Shital was mentioning, the last part of the, the webinar is about addressing. So the questions we have, um, the one question we have actually, it's about practices, guidelines, principles um, that could help address or avoid fragmentation of the user, internet user experience. So any ideas or thoughts you might have on this will be um, really relevant for us. So I'll, I'll give you the floor back, Marielza, um, and thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bruna. Um, um, well, first, let me just touch very quickly upon some of the issues that are, that appear there, you know, like, um, you know, uh, in the chat, because, you know, some of them are quite interesting and have to do with, uh, with uh, what I'm talking about here in terms of how do we address these issues, you know. Um, well, um, UNESCO has developed a, a concept called Internet Universality, and it's funny because, you know, there are actual articles, and it's interesting, there are actual articles out there that says this is the, you know, Internet Universality is the opposite of Internet fragmentation. And we don't see Internet Universality as the issues of connecting more people to the Internet, but the issues of giving more people what is codified in international legal frameworks, which is the right to access to information. You know, so it's a, we keep talking about, you know, connecting to the internet, but what is the point of connecting to the internet without actual access to the to information and to our, the freedom of expression? This is what human rights frameworks, the rights framework is about. So we, you know, we, we don't look at the issue in this way. But uh, internet universality is premised essentially in four principles. A principle of uh, being a, that internet, the internet should develop on the basis of, you know, being a human rights based or, 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 or space or, or uh, um, 
a way of you know a, a series of of uh, um, technologies and 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 uh, social interactions that respect human rights, that it should be open, accessible, open to all, accessible by all, and most stakeholder led. You know, so all those things we consider as part of the concept of internet universality, uh, in the sense that uh, you know you it's not enough to connect people. It's you know unless they have true access to content and they and are able to enjoy and interact with others, you know, uh, uh, enjoy this content, extract social economic value from participating in this ecosystem, then it's it's meaningless. Um, and that's that's uh, human rights based, open, accessible, mode stakeholders spell out the Rome, you know, principles that uh, that um, UNESCO has been uh, putting forward. Within the concept of openness, we we encompass a series of elements. You know, an open internet is uh, is one that has you know open standards, open markets, open content being offered, open data, and open government. You know, and there are some principles that are under that that says, for example, you know, governments should, you know, make available, you know, to citizens uh, all the public information that is, you know, uh, that is generated with public funds, unless, of course, there is an issue of, uh, you know, national security or whatever. But this is, it's, you know, as much as possible, citizens should have access to that. Uh, that um, th there are different responsibilities that we all have you know so it's not, the the fragmentation you know is it's uh, or the not openness you know the the closeness is not a responsibility of one particular stakeholder but we all have responsibilities for example you know government should be you know helping to incentivize you know the the creation of infrastructure um that uh, connects all that uh, you know the the following of standards uh, and uh, you know companies should be you know as much as possible not you know crowding out other ideas from the ideas marketplace you know and when we have for example uh, a social media platform that keeps its users inside and extracts all the uh, uh, ad profit you know possible that crowds out social you know media traditional media content and uh, others that are actually failing big time right now um platforms have a responsibility of making you know uh, uh, languages available so that people can exchange more that being accessibility features for persons with disabilities and the elderly so that they can actually have uh, access to information not access to the internet necessarily, just that. You know, so th those are the concepts that we look at, principles that we think about. There are 44 countries in the world that are actually using uh, the basis, the, the indicator base that UNESCO has to look at how their internet is developing and finding gaps and finding opportunities uh, for further development that then lead to recommendations and improvements in that regard. You know, Brazil, you know, we're both Brazilian. Brazil was the very first country in the world uh, to, to publish a, an internet universality report. You know, we had others like Argentina, we had uh, Germany and et cetera. And all of them find that there are opportunities for improving how people actually enjoy access to information on, you know, online. So uh, you know, it's not about uh, uh, it's not about blaming anybody or saying you know or or but but uh, at looking at the different types of responsibilities and the set of things that we need to do in order to really enable people to enjoy you know their right to expression and access to information online and there are different aspects of it and you know some people mentioned the issues of intentionality indeed if you're trying to keep somebody. Uh, locked in a particular uh, 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 system or a particular platform or particular something that and you know uh, then then when there is no um, opportunity for the user you know and uh, to to really enjoy you know the full fullness of the information ecosystem the knowledge ecosystem online then that's what from our perspective we consider you know the opposite of openness which to us is internet fragmentation because it's affecting the human right we actually have codified in international legal frameworks you know so meaningful connectivity is not a right a legal right in that sense but 
you know, but access to information is. So I'll just stop here. Thanks a lot, Maria Elza. And um, a lot of the aspects you brought out are really relevant because, again, the con this conversation is also about, um, to some extent, um, having influence or like some set influence over users' access to the internet and the provision of services in the end of the day. So I would, I would just really like to highlight this aspect from this kind of a collective and systematic approach to the access um, to to the general and broader discussions about access to the internet where each of the stakeholders has its role in um, providing that it happens in the scenario does um, move forward. Um, so thanks a lot for your points. I'm gonna hand the floor to you Farzani um, to add some interventions about this, this last question as well. Uh, so I come, uh, I think that I come to this from a connectivity and access angle. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, for us to come up with uh, best practices and uh, principles, we have to first identify as you mentioned, which actors are involved and why are they and uh, why are they uh, blocking access to access to their services or to certain services? Uh, and um, and then also like measure the, uh, the effect to to then come up uh, with practices and uh, guidelines. And I don't think and and each digital service, as I mentioned, is different, like the ecosystem, like the internet ecosystem. So if you uh, if you don't have access to Facebook, is uh, different from like if you don't have access to your uh, to your IP addresses. So uh, I think that we have to when we want to come up uh, with guidelines and principles, we have to also be clear about what we are talking about. Use uh, what experience uh, we are, uh, what user experience we are uh, talking about, and what sort of access we are we are talking about, and that way, uh, then uh, we can uh, come up with guidelines and principles, and they can be like human rights based, um, or uh, they can be, uh, for example, a, a lot of countries and uh, the European Union, uh, for example, they have passed resolutions about how they want to keep the internet global and uh, interconnected. So um, in order for us to go and uh, kind of like come up with these uh, best practices, we first have to uh, have to know which digital service we are uh, talking about, uh, who is uh, uh, being affected and how, and, uh, how it's being done in order to um, come up with uh, principles. For me, as I said, uh, I think that the most important um, uh, that can affect online uh, is the digital uh, services that can affect um, uh, people's presence uh, on the internet so th uh, that people can't even have any kind of user experience. Then we go to the other, uh, uh, to the other user uh, experiences and access to digital services that have alternatives for them, but they could be these alternatives uh, because of internet consolidation or because of uh, because of the market dominance, uh, 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 market dominance of certain, uh, um, uh, for example, financial institutions, these might be like the, there might not be like meaningful alternative to them. That's another kind of uh, user uh, experience. But then uh, also like we can have um, user experiences that are hampered by uh, blocking and, and censoring. Um, and whether and I told uh, uh, so, I, I think that um, I, I think that as, as uh, and I also mentioned this uh, to Shital. I still don't know if uh, these practices, if the uh, if the user user experiences are different in just certain areas or in like temporarily, as opposed to like uh, permanently and kind of like globally like. 
uh, affects the majority. How are we gonna like define and uh, define those? And uh, when are we gonna like uh, talk about? When are we gonna decide that we are gonna take action and this is bad for the internet and this contributes to internet fragmentation? So I don't have any guidelines or principles at the moment for you, but I have been saying this 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 the last thing. If there is no alternative to that digital service online and it impact, impacts connectivity, then I think we need to prioritize that. We need to tell the governments and the uh, corporations and the actors that are uh, that are doing these things um, not to do them. Thanks a lot, Farzani. Um, and I totally agree. Like we need to further develop the mappings and assessments on, on to what in, in order to understand to what extent um, these events exist and what sorts of events are we talking about? Are we just uh, are we explicitly talking about fragmentation from the technical layer, or are we just discussing um, possible hampering or interference in general access to the internet? based on censorship or other um, governmental ideas or bad ideas in this case. So we do need to qualify this discussion a little bit um, better. And I guess that like just looking back at last year's discussions, it was clear to us that um, we needed to, to take a look at, at some extent of the user experience, but it was this was the basket that needed um, the best kind of like definitions and further discussions on just so we could enhance how the debate um, was done. So fully agree with the idea of improving the mappings and assessments, especially to understand this. Um, Zach, I'm gonna hand you the floor as well. And you're welcome to, to bring in your interventions on this last question. Yeah, thank you, Bruna. Um, yeah, it, it's certainly a, um, you know, broad ranging question and having just had recent discussions in the past year or so on defining internet shutdowns, I can definitely appreciate uh, how, you know, kind of defining and scoping this is incredibly difficult. Um, as far as, you know, yeah, answering this this last question, um, I think the kind of advocacy, and, you know, policy strategies we have um, for the, the Keep It On campaign are, are, are pretty uh, wide ranging. Um, so that, goes from everything uh, from kind of public uh, shaming during shutdowns and, you know, public pressure and, and open letters uh, to a lot of, you know, direct policymaker engagement, um, you know, working, you know, with multilateral bodies to, um, you know, kind of set norms, you know, against internet shutdowns. Um, so I, I think, you know, that there's probably some overlap there that gets a little bit outside um, my wheelhouse, um, mostly on kind of the research and, and data side for, for shutdowns. Um, but as far as yeah, interventions and you know advocacy, um, you know we've had a, a good amount of success, uh, which is kind of this sustained approach, you know, to speaking with governments and trying to help them understand, uh, you know, in in kind of their uh, based on their motivations and, and you know the kind of things that are important to them, like the economic impacts of, of shutdowns um, that. Uh, what we see is kind of these direct human rights impacts and, and things that um, you know are, are important, but sometimes that kind of language and and framing just falls a little bit flat, you know, when we're speaking with some government stakeholders. So trying to make them understand that if you want to grow your economy, if you want to be connected, you know, um, you know, to to the you know kind of international world, and uh, that shutting down the internet is is really a huge harm to you know growing your economy and uh, kind of. You know, being a legitimate, um, you know, uh, kind of player, but then there's also these kind of regional influences where if they see neighboring countries shutting down the internet and they kind of see it as part of their playbook, that it becomes a tool that they're using as well, um, and they're sharing, you know, methods to do this and you know things that uh, sometimes uh, they feel like will provide the least amount of blowback. So we've actually seen recently that um, during elections, because that was a very high profile thing that shutdowns were happening during, um, that they've stopped somewhat during as, quite as many elections because they know there's a lot of international pressure uh, against them, uh, but they'll uh, you know do it during other events or they'll target very specific populations. So I think that's something to address as well. I've, I put a couple examples in the, in the chat, but um, you know, when you're talking about fragmentation, uh, this is something we see a lot in India where uh, they'll have mobile shutdowns which are, you know, 
uh, impacting a you know a more marginalized section of the population, um, uh, poorer part of the population uh, through a mobile block, usually in very specific neighborhoods, but then broadband access remains. And so, you know, what does that kind of mean for fragmentation as well? So just a few few thoughts um, as far as uh, overall principles and guidelines for, um, you know, your question here. Um, hopefully that, that's kind of helpful with, with framing, but uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Kennedy. It's super helpful, especially the part about um, being more vocal about the issues and the, the actual um, results of shutdowns or any interference and in access that's caused by governments. It is, in fact, um, an issue that's been affecting a lot of our place, our countries and regions that um, either shutdowns or like um, further censorship attempts are part of a bigger interference strategy on democratic processes. And it's not, and it's it's kind of an interesting moment where we're not just solely speaking about access to information and then like the very initial things about um, this discussion, but actually um, is speaking about much um, kind of like you raised the bar on this debate and you raised the bar on the restrictions and and how this can um, interfere in, in the future processes. I see a lot of um, interesting chats and debates on the on our meeting chat, but I would like to ask if anyone wants to come in. In this debate, just raise your hand or open your mic. Um, Vittorio, please take the floor. Yeah, so since I've, I've heard so much stuff in chat, I wanted to collate a little. I mean, first, I mean, before coming to discuss any of these uh, situations, I think that our number one objective is really being unpacking issues further and being sure about the classification. Because, for example, I think, I mean, I had, had understood that internet shutdowns would be fragmentation at the technical level, so like anything that blocks the entire network more than at the user experience level. So, I mean, the, the, perhaps the most important issue we had in this range, but yeah, uh, we should be sure that we devote the calls to the appropriate parts once we unpack the stuff. And in terms of the higher layer, let's say user experience things, I think the priorities really depend on who you are, where you are from, what's your experience. So I see why for certain people, I mean, the fragmentation by governments is the most important one. From my viewpoint, honestly, the, in my experience, the fragmentation by private sector, like the big uh, mobile OS platforms that, I mean, build a wall garden, so you buy a phone and then you're forced to basically do whatever the mobile OS operator wants you to do and only access the apps that they approve. And I mean, this to me is a form of fragmentation that is more concerning, but this is because I have the lack of living in a country where there are no internal shutdowns and there's content blocking. There is content blocking, but it's li limited to categories that I can live with, not to political content or I mean, new sources or whatever. So perhaps we, we should go further and unpack the fragmentation of the user experience level into different parts. And maybe we can have um, work on different people, maybe work on different things, but let's make sure we finish the classification before we actually start to discuss how to address some of these specific issues. Otherwise it will be a problem to come to conclusions if we keep on mixing the issues. Thanks a lot, Vittorio, and point taken. Um, it's really relevant that you're bringing this up about us working on the classifications or even um, trying to address how the three baskets that we suggested to the broader um, PNIF framework, they kind of meet. Where do they um, find these common points and whether, um, as you mentioned, uh, shutdown can be seen as a technical fragmentation example or what else should be discussed in this um, in this process. And I also take the point of considering um, fragmentation by private sector and the kind of like the market um, dominance of some companies as well. So thanks a lot for your comments. Um, I'm going to hand the floor to Yik. Yeah, hi, sorry, I, I didn't act. Uh, I, I prefer not to switch on my, my uh, video. But I think uh, uh, if we look at all these different issues, like uh, uh, domination, manipulation, or the access to internet, or the meaningful access, or even the interaction, you know, uh, the participation in public sphere, uh, affairs, maybe we can, we can focus on one uh, aspect of the user experience, which is a meaningful access to internet and the information due to fragmentation. Maybe that is the minimal uh, commonality we call, we all agree. So we work on, we start with that because I think there's a too many different aspects we're talking about. So we just focus on one uh, general uh, uh, 
problem we all agreed, then we start from there, like a meaningful access to internet and the information due to fragmentation. That's my suggestion, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Izan. I see your hand up as well. Thanks, Bruna. Um, so my comments, uh, based on all of the discussions that we've had, I mean, we, there was already a policy network on meaningful access uh, recently, and I think what we should do is we should be very careful to try to not to conflate issues that you know could arise out of uh, fragmentation or are very interrelated with fragmentation. Um, and I think what we need to do is we need to lay a sort of a conceptual groundwork or a series of assumptions upon which we will then be able to evaluate whether something is considered fragmentation or not. So because meaningful access, for example, uh, touches upon very, very different issues in my view, for example, the issues of the digital divide, or, you know, for example, if we're looking at the Rome principles, the issue of accessibility, linguistic diversity, and so on, I think all of those things do have elements of fragmentation, but they should not be considered in the same vein as what we're trying to be talking about over here when we're talking about the user experience. So in my view, what we should have is some ground level assumptions about the level of access and about the level of uh, diversity. And upon having those assumptions, we then build upon, okay, now if we have this, what should we consider as being fragmentation? What isn't fragmentation? Because fundamentally, from my point of view, it's all about access to resources, access to information, does somebody sitting somewhere across the world have the same access to a particular resource that I do? And if they don't, well, why is that the case? Um, so sure, they might be able to uh, access a website, but does that mean that they're not able to access, for example, the services that the website provides? Those are, again, two com completely different conceptual issues, in my view. Um, and, and I think that, in my view, the best approach going forward would be to start from the ground up for what it is that we would like to be able to move forward from in terms of this sort of base state or this starting point. Um, and then maybe perhaps we'll be able to narrow down the scope of the discussion instead of expanding it so much to include basically everything at this point. Because if one country has a different law or a different language or a different big platform, like for example, you might have WeChat in China and Facebook in the US, you know, you might say, oh, you have issues of dominance and you have issues of connectivity and you have issues of language. And all of those things are also fragmentation, where, when in my view, sure, those are all important issues, but we should try to narrow down the definition of what we want to be focusing on. This is my sort of two cents on this. Thank you. Thanks so much, Izan. And uh, also another point taken about the, the flagging, the nuances on all of these. I, I see Farzani's comment on the chat as well about... Um, the whole discussion on finding commonalities and that maybe access is meaningful access is not necessarily this one commonality here, but kind of like maybe paves the way to finding one or has some relation to it. But it, it is indeed one of the issues where one of the cases where people can have access to the whole infrastructure, but not actually um, be able to see any of the content or even the platforms or things like that, or even when um, this lack of access is facilitated by um, authorities, um, interference or anything of the sort. So I do agree that um, the, the idea of like finding some conceptual groundwork um, would be interesting for us moving forward as well. Um, I guess, I, I don't know if anyone else would like to come in as well. Um, if so, we still have time for one. Yeah, first, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, so I <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to, so I just want to ask an existential question. Why are we here? Why are we talking about internet fragmentation? Is this an ideology? Is the global internet an ideology for us that we are going to die for it? Are we being like uh, internet globalists? Or is it like, why do we not want internet fragmentation in the first place? And then, then then when we kind of like understand our objectives, then we can look at the threats to, uh, uh, to the internet and then come up, uh, come up with solutions. I actually don't think that we really need to use this, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to use this framework for, to use this term for a lot of the issues that we are discussing. But I think that we should really focus on why are we talking about internet fragmentation? Why are we so worried? And then when we, and for me, 
it's about access because that's what online presence uh, gets threatened. And I'm going to uh, uh, jot down a few other thoughts in the chat, but I think we should really, really think about why are we here? Why are we talking about this? Hmm. No. Thanks a lot, Maria Elza. Yes, thank you. Now, following up on, on that, uh, uh, exactly, because I think that uh, we are here to, because one of the biggest problems we are facing right now is the erasure of social cohesion. We don't have a global social contract anymore, anymore. you know, and, uh, you know, uh, a social contract in a way, you know, a social cohesion and understanding and tolerance and all that, it, it's literally evaporating. I've, we've never seen societies that have been so polarized. We are polarized on a global geopolit ge geopolitics way internally within countries and so on and so forth. And quite a lot of that, that has to do, you know, with the effects that fragmentation are causing you know, uh, um, on us in the kind of fragmentation of access to shared reality, you know, and that shared reality is something that uh, that we need to understand. The more we need to, you know, we need to be exposed to different uh, uh, points of view, you know, in order to actually form our own point of view rather than be driven down, you know, uh, constantly be driven down echo chambers that really, you know, uh, impose external views on us. So that's the that's the thing, the crowding out of you know I, of ideas from the marketplace that really drives us uh, you know this way. But I think that one of the things that we we actually you know uh, could be a very interesting uh, um, outcome of this discussion today is that we actually uh, uh, started to see some of the overlaps between some of these concepts that we've been using. You know, meaningful access, fragmentation, uh, you know, shutdowns and things like that. So, you know, perhaps a, a kind of a framework that places them in different, you know, in, in one big concept, because one of the things, you know, it, it's very strange for us to be talking about, you know, uh, uh, in a way, you know, uh, um, you know, we need to, you know, to close digital devices, or we need to give meaningful access, but then we need to talk about, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, how to, you know, uh, avoid, you know, this and that, you know, so we, without actually having any boundaries between those, you know, or, or, or at least a, a, an understanding of where one of these concepts ends and the other starts, you know, so I think that that, that would be one thing, you know, if we could drive uh, you know, have a good picture at least of uh, what all those concepts mean and how they talk, you know, they, they interconnect. I think that that would be a major contribution already. But thank you very much for, you know, a super rich discussion. And I learned a lot from everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Maria Elza. Thanks a lot. And I am really happy to see that at least common ground uh, access has been emerging as a common grounding for this discussion. And also, I'm going to take some time to thank um, the, well, we have some volunteers for a working group on um, user experience. So thanks a lot to everybody that um, raised their hands to help in this. We really aimed for um, to have these smaller discussions and more a more focused approach, but um, also answering your question um, for Zani. I guess we're here in an attempt to make these discussions a little more feasible or relatable to the end user and, and to kind of like, I would say even democratize a little bit of the fragmentation debates and um, just bring everybody um, to the same um, table because it was a, it has been a, a rather difficult or like harder to grasp um, debate. So um, yeah, just to answer your very existential question and a very existential day because we're all still working on um, workshop submissions. So but I don't know if anyone else would like to add any last words, a last tweet, a call for action about um, the debates we just had today. Um, but I'll, I'll just open the floor once again. If not, we can give you um, four minutes back of your days. Can I come in quickly, Bruna? Um, that's OK. Uh, sorry, I don't want to um, steal people's time. But I, I think it's it's important to recognize, as you said, uh, just how much has been shared here and how this is a process. Um, I think it's a very complex topic and um, it's a, it's it's really helpful to just have everyone's perspectives thrown into into um, the conversation. And for me, um, it is it is a um, a very important exercise to be done in this type of format, which is bottom up and 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 
part of the IGF and open to anyone. So I don't think as a result, it's it's easy, but I think it's very, very essential. Um, and it'll take time to process what has been discussed. There's been lots of resources shared. There's been a lot of ideas shared, examples, um, but some commonality around, I think, um, what we're talking about ultimately around access and how, um, what that, uh, what it means when that is, um, that is not a, when people cannot have that. Of course, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and, and there were some points around intentionality and um, impact, but I think there's a lot to work on. And it's so great that five people have volunteered to do that. So, um, we will be in touch to, to facilitate that, um, and to, to, to support you um, to unpack that further and, and to concretize um, this discussion once we have been able to do all that processing. But we also have a, a webinar coming up at the end of um, June on the 27th of June, um, uh, which relates to the fragmentation of the internet's technical layer. And we would like to think about the intersections between the three buckets as well. So we encourage everyone to think about that, perhaps reflect on how the discussions from the previous to now on internet governance and on user experience could relate to the technical layer as well. Um, and we thought perhaps there could be one webinar we do where we're, we're thinking about the intersections and focusing on that after we've done all three, but that's just an idea for now. Um, really, um, thank you. Oh yes, Mary Elsa, you know, you've also suggested the, the thing, consideration of the inter, intersections between different, um, the different ideas. So. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really found it invigorating um, to, to be here <laughs> and um, looking forward to what comes next. Also adding my thanks and have a nice rest of your days, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.